Welcome to Drinks Coach. Back again. Part two of Waitrose. Yes, continuing our roundup. A few more to go. Um, I've asked co-op for stuff. We'll see if that turns up. I'm sure it will. Um, and I've got a couple of other interesting shows coming up. There's a show I want to do on premium Cabernet and Cabernet blends to describe to people exactly how different styles of Cabernet taste from the top places like Bordeaux, South Africa, Chile, Australia, whatever. But some people have been very generous to send me samples recently. And I've thought that if I collect those together in one show, then I do everyone the justice they deserve. But uh, watch out for that show. If you like Cabernet Sauvignon, this is the mother load. And all those wines, I think, as far as I know, are still available. So uh, what we've got here? Five wines from Waitrose, my alma mater, my former employer. Um, so without further ado, let's start. This is the first one. Um, I picked these partly, I think, because there's some nostalgia in me with these wines. But this wine is called La Comelle, Chateau Capendu, La Comelle. Now, try to look up what La Comelle means. Um, and there is a place in the uh, uh, in Franche-Comté, in the centre of France, where the, lady, the first lady ever to, to travel around the world uh, to, to navigate by yacht um, was born. So I have no idea whether La Comelle has some private... Um, story or name, but this is Chateau Capondu. Now, the first time I drank Chateau Capondu, I think it was six ninety nine or eight ninety nine, and it was a wine that was offered to my, I wouldn't call it my boss, but my senior colleague, D Blackstock, who was great friends with a guy called Mark Linton. Mark Linton um, has been a broker of wines from the south of France for forever, and was a very keen golfer created a brand called Winter Hill, which is named after Waitrose's or John Lewis's own golf course, Winter Hill Concourse. Um, now, Chateau Capondu used to be made by a real special winemaker, a winemaker that I think a lot of people uh, would doff their cap to, given the chance. His name Alain Grignon. And Alain Grignon actually makes some really juicy, easy-drinking Carignan for Majestic this year. It's literally called Alain Grignon. Carignan. Um, but this estate, it appears, has been sold to or been bought by uh, the giant presence in the Languedoc, that is Jean Claude Mass. Uh, Jean Claude Mass. Um, so Jean Paul, who's the, uh, the the senior winemaker, is now uh, in charge of these wines. Although I'm not sure if he specifically makes it. This wine's about 14% alcohol. It's Chateau Capendu, La Comel. It's a Corbier. A Corbier is that is one of those appellations in the south which has finally, thank God, finally been given the credit where credit is due. I'm a particular fan of Corbière, but as a group of wine areas, you've got Corbière, Minervois, Fitou, you've got all these different areas. And Minervois has a premium, premier crew area called La Lavinière. Corbière has a bank of vineyards, which are really quite extraordinary, called Boutonac. Um, but this, this was the driving red wine plonk of Paris once the railways got that far south. And indeed the rest of the world and England and every single sangria I made till the age of about 30 was made from wine from the Languedoc Roussillon. But these wines now are starting to show real regional style, real identity and are really great value for money. I'm not talking about Minervois La Lavinière, which would be about 20 odd pounds, but regular Minervois, everyday Minervois, can be bought for less than 10 pounds. And some of them are very, very good. So I'm gonna pour this for you now. This is 8.99. They're making wine at this estate uh, for well over 100 years, I think it's 1892 or something, something like that. Um, it's 1892, it says on the neck. Okay, so. What's Jean Paul Mass done with this wine? So, what's it going to be made from? It's almost certainly going to be made from some Carignan, which is something that he specialises in. Grenache is a main body of wine. Syrah may have a little bit. I think if it's from here, it could. Have, I think it's allowed a bit of Merlot, although he doesn't always use it. I, I, I prefer not to have a crossover of great varieties from regions, and Merlot is very definitely a Bordeaux variety. Um, this wine has a beautiful colour to it. I mean, it really does. It's got a sort of brick tinge to it. Typically, these wines are either made using the traditional method where they press the grapes and then ferment it, or using the carbonic maceration method, or uh, for many people, we call that the Beaujolais method, where they use whole bunches of grapes, don't press them, and they burst under their own pressure, leaving lots of colour but a soft wine. Or you can go semi carbonic and have crushed grapes, 
whole bunch, crust flakes, whole bunch. Uh, the Australians refer to this as sandwich fermentation, or the sandwich ferment. If you can hear a helicopter in the background, it's doing one of two things. There's either been a breakout at Wandsworth Prison, or somebody's complained there's a smell of cannabis somewhere in this estate, and they're looking for heat signatures on the roof. A local cop told me that recently. But the flipping helicopters are here all the time. I apologise, but I'm not stopping. I'm in full flow. Okay, so, right. Ah, this is, this is what wine... If you're at a party in France and you've got a plate of cheese and ham and there's some gypsy jazz in the background and it's summer and somebody just pours you a random glass of what we call vin glu glu or glug of a wine, this is what you want it to smell like. The smell just puts a smile on my face straight away. <laughs> it's kind of jammy, but not. It's kind of like somebody's just putting a little bit of cherry, chocolate, a cherry liqueur in your red wine. It's soft. It's quaffable, it's pretty, it's juicy. No doubt it will age. I'm not sure whether it will improve, but it will change over the next two or three years. But now with a plate of ham and or, or just 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 regular paysan French food, this is this is what wine's supposed to taste like. I think there must have been a time in the world where this flavour was called wine. Okay. Eight ninety nine. If you want to put people's faces that way up this Christmas, Chateau Capondu from Waitrose. Eight ninety nine from John Claude Mass. I must say that I, that, that wine just just gave me such a, a buzz. I can't tell you, fantastic. Okay, moving on. Oh, I can hear my lovely wife appearing in the background. Emma, is that you? No, you're not filming. Yes, I am. I'm going to carry on though. It's okay. I'm nearly finished. Okay, so this one, next wine. Uh, I was looking for something um, of value from South Africa, from a premium estate, and this, this came just at the right moment at the Waitrose press tasting. This is a Rustenburg, which is actually Stellenbosch, but the mountain of Helderberg is one of the most striking hills. It looks a bit like a mini Matterhorn, really. Uh, it has very high altitude, altitude vineyards on top. It also has a shooting range. So if you're one of those people who wants to know what it's like to shoot a 0.44 Ruger Blackhawk, that's the place you go. Anyway, so this isn't what this place is famous for. It's the Caterpillar family, the Merriman family that actually own the estate, I believe. And they're very well known for making really premium Chardonnay. Um, I think the Wine Society always has a few Magnums of Rustenburg to be sold um, during Christmas. But also, this wine isn't Cabernet or Merlot. This is Malbec. This is... This is, um, well, it's, it's the, the, the darling of the UK, right? You know, everyone wants to drink Argentinian Malbec. I don't. I like drinking French Malbec from Cahors. Um, so I didn't know that Rustenburg had some Malbec. This is going to be yours for about 12 quid, 12 or 13 pounds, I think it is. Let's have a look at the price. Uh, round up part two. It's 12 99 13 quid. Anything from Rustenburg at 13 quid is a bargain. I show my age to remember a time when we used to sell Rustenburg Chardonnay at Waitrose for 5 99 next to Jordan Chardonnay and Warwick Chardonnay. Uh, those wines are much more expensive now. But those wines, as we discovered, um, with people complaining that they didn't like them when they were older, they sent them back to us at the Waitrose head office. And we tasted them 10 years old and they were amazing. If you don't want them, we'll keep them. Here's the money. Um, so here we go, Malbec. So what, what do we expect from a New World Malbec? Well, first of all, I'm looking at it against the screen of my iPad and it's not a dark wine. Malbec, the black country wines of France was the name for, for Cahors back in the day. But this wine is remarkably not opaque. I can see through it, but it's also a very, very deep, deep, deep vermilion, kind of purple vermilion in colour. The nose has something which is quite New World telltale in Malbec, which is, it smells of clove. I mean, not loads of clove, maybe black cardamom, but you, you get what I'm saying. There's that kind of exotic spice, clovey, nutmeggy. It doesn't smell so strong that you think you can numb a tooth with it, but it's just there, right? And then you've got this um, plummy fruit as well. What this wine has in its favour is it tastes so delicious young. This is 2022. 
There's a lovely grip of tannin on the finish. I dare say there's no oak here. I don't feel it anywhere. I just feel fruit tannin and the crunchiness. This is a wine designed to be just enjoyed the moment you buy it. And coming from an estate which has had so many famous people work there, um, one of the great, great superstars of winemaking who now lives in Svartland, this guy called Artie Bardenhorst, who studied winemaking out in Australia and in, in South Africa. And, um, yeah, he, he kind of put Rustenburg on the map as a winemaker. <laughs> this is made by someone entirely different. I'm sorry, I'll come and visit you soon. <laughs> well, what can I say? Lovely. 13 quid. It's not a big beast in the way that you might expect. It's not heavy or thick. It's crunchy and juicy um, and would give any really stylish Argentine Malbec a run for its money, particularly if you don't like them too oaky. This wine is oak free, as far as I can tell. Now we're on to three absolutely, oh, this is kind of like the final straight, the home straight of some beautiful wines for Christmas. I'm starting off with this. Now, I think at the price that this normally costs, which is $14.99 or $15.99, this wine has so much pedigree. Um, I remember working in my parents' restaurants when I was in college. When I was 17 years old, we used to have um, vintages of Chateau Liversant on our list. Remember the last vintage she ever sold when I was about 25 was 1986. And my mother and I drank a bottle of that about six years ago, and it was still, still rocking. This is not a Grand Cru Classé. It's not one of the great 61, as they call, call it in Bordeaux. But it is a Cru Bourgeois, which means that in the 50s it was given um, merit for being uh, better than average, if you like. Um, and in some cases, some Cru Bourgeois are very much more better than average and should, I think, in some ways be reclassified. Um, but Chateau Liversant, it's a classic looking bottle of claret. Look at that. I mean, that's about as classic a bottle you've ever going to see. Nice, heavy bottle. Liversant, right on the front. Cru Bourgeois. Made by Antoine Mouix. Mouix is one of the um, one of the superstar families of Bordeaux. Christian Mouix, of course, who owns Chateau Petrus, uh, the world's most expensive Merlot. Um, same family. So this is Cru Bourgeois Haute Medoc, 2015. 2015 was one of those vintages which, in Cru Bourgeois terms, because Cru uh, Classé wines um, tend to have the best slopes, 15 in some wines was almost too ripe. It was almost like the vineyards were facing too much in the right direction. But for those vineyards that don't quite make the grade for Cru Classé, but have been classified as Cru Bourgeois, maybe because the vineyards are in a slightly different direction, maybe because the soils are a bit more alluvial and less sophisticated. Um, 15 was good. 2015 has turned out to be, I think, generally and universally, a very fine Medoc vintage. And this is no Medoc from 2015. Um, 15 was warm, spicy, the wines have developed quite quickly, but I think in a good way. Uh, I think they've got plenty of distance to go. But if you like your Bordeaux with plenty of flavour and pluck, 2015 is a good country, a good good vintage to go for. If I look at the colour, you can see there's bottle age on there. So that's about eight years old now. Um, it's got some lovely, slightly brick red edges to it. Just smells just a pure, it's just Bordeaux. It's almost a Sort of like this dried herb, just cold bouillon smell through the middle of it. This is fifty percent Merlot, and it and it's very obviously Merlot driven. And the rest of the vintages of, of the grape varieties will obviously be Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon, etc. Pretty Vido. If it wasn't for the kind of desiccation, that's like dryness on the nose. I might have even picked this as a right bank wine. This wine actually doesn't smell a million, ways, million miles away uh, because of the ripeness of the vintage to a, maybe a 2014 Santa Menil or something like that, um, which in of itself um, is a bad thing because we're discussing fine wines versus fine wines. And for Christmas, this is going to be a tenner. Yes, it's fully mature. There's no doubt about that. This wine needs drinking. Um, but if you want a fully mature claret to go with your roast goose, because that is the best match, uh, or maybe roast lamb, or maybe beef on the ears. Um, try and find a better wine than this. There's, I've, I've had a few Bordeaux in this run-up, in the uh, round-up section of this channel over the last few weeks, but this one's going to be hard to beat. A 
of the Chateau Les Moines, 2010, from Adnams. If you're prepared to pay the extra seven quid, is the one to beat. But this is a £10 wine this Christmas. You're not going to find a better cloud than that for £10. Anywhere. Okay, moving on to the last two. Um, we have another special, which is in the Waitrose perennial down to a tenner kind of promotion. They do a list of wines which are £10 that shouldn't be. So this is a full £5 knockoff down to £10. And we'll come on to the next one in a minute. But in between, it's maybe my pick for... Fillet steak this Christmas. If you're going to have a, a night where there's steak or there's beef, or if you prefer to have a room of beef on Christmas Day, and you're not beholden to the, the whole turkey malarkey, then this is the wine you should be looking for. Now, since we came back on air, as it were, in the last 11 shows, I've mentioned, I know at least several times, how special 2020 has been in Italy for both Piemonte, where Barbara, Barbaresco and Barolo come from, and also Chianti. Uh, and Tuscany, where Bolgari, Chianti, Brunello, Vinlo di Montepulciano comes from. And it's the lesser wines, like the Rosso di Montalcino or the um, Lange Nebbiolo, Nebbiolo d'Alba, where, and, and also not Reserva Chianti or Gran Selezione, but regular Chianti Classico. 2020 has been a gold mine of beautiful, beautiful wines. Bring us on to this. This is called Ardalito. But is it our daddy co? It feels right to say that, although I don't think the single C was hard. But I'm going to say our daddy co. County Classico DOCG 2020. The label might be familiar to some of you because it looks very much like the label on Agricola Cerciabella. And Cerciabella is one of, for me, one of the great guiding lights of Chianti. There are a lot of people out there that are now making Chianti in a much more modern way to appeal to the Americans and the Chinese by using Syrah, Merlot and Cabernet in their blends. I refuse to spend my own money on those wines because I can buy wines like that elsewhere, which are better uh, and indeed are more true to themselves. This is 100% Sangiovese. Huzzah. 100% Sangiovese from 70, count them, separate plots. And... Those plots can come from all of the main regions of Chianti Classico. We've got a bunch of hills. We've got Giallo. We've got Rada in Chianti. We've also got Greve in Chianti. And this is the pick of the bunch all mixed together. Leftovers, but not leftovers. It, more a carefully selected spice mix. Um, so I'm quite excited about trying this again. Because when I taste it on the day, I'm like, oh, here's another 2020 Chianti Classico. I hope it comes up to snuff. And boy, did it. Okay. So it's got the colour of Chianti, which is brick red, always. Chianti should be red, nothing else. Sangiovese, 100%. Where's my steak? I want my shallow steak, medium rare, please. It's almost like it's got a little bit, just a hint of Worcester sauce in it, which is something I say about Sangiovese quite a lot. And famously, when I was doing a TV show called Richard and Judy, um, on Richard and Judy, there was a, um, a wine club, which we did. And I got into some trouble because I was talking about the Chianti Classico that we were featuring on the show. And I was saying, oh, this tastes like, oh, it reminds me of spice. It's almost like putting Worcester sauce on the steak. It's almost like it seasons the food for you. It's fantastic. And then we got to the abbot and went, cut, cut. And they went, in the abbot, you do realise that this show is sponsored by Liam Perrin's Worcester sauce. Um, of course I didn't. And I nearly got chopped for that. But there we go. <laughs> Still here, doing my thing. Okay, cheers. phrase I used to talk a lot to my mate about with um, Tuscan wines is it's only truly Tuscan if you can taste the crenellation. That sounds wanky, doesn't it? Crenellations are on on a castle, the, the, the little kind of, you know, the ups and downs and mannerism is the texture on a building. And this isn't supposed to be a free ride. It's not supposed to be silky and glossy and soft, which is what Merlot gives you, what Cabernet gives you. And frankly, Tuscany does that really well too. You can go to Bulgari and drink a bottle of Sassicaia or Ornellaia or Massetto. These wines are hundreds of pounds a bottle, but they're all about the sheen, the glide. It's like a Bugatti Veyron. But Chianti Classico is not a Bugatti Veyron. Chianti Classico should be 
the slightly unreliable Fiat that has a noise that sounds amazing when the engine's on song. Choke to choke. That's what you want. You want the detail. You want the character. And this wine is full of character, albeit slightly polished. It's very, very good. 19.99, 20 quid. That's what you pay these days for premium Chianti Classico. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is premium Chianti Classico. Going to the last wine. Just over the 20 minute mark. Trying to keep these a little bit shorter than normal. <coughs> I believe it's supposed to be the oldest port cellar, port cellar house in the whole of Portugal. Um, you may have seen this bottle knocking around. But they are a, a business, a part of a company called Sogovinius, who have totally transformed their fortunes. And they have these giant cellars. If you go to Porto, up on the... On the, uh, the, <laughs> on, the on the other side <laughs> from Porto, I have a complete mental block. Um, Gaia, on the... Ga nearly stopped recording there. Gaia on the Gaia side, or the Villanova, the new town, Villanova de Gaia. If you're on the Gaia side, which is the southern side of Douro, uh, next to this beautiful railway bridge that's up there, you'll see the Sugovinish cellars. And somebody's come in and seen what amazing stocks had in the past and have rearranged and reorganised and recategorised their wines. Have noticed how much single vineyard wine has been in barrel for many, 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 many years. And have recategorized them as Colliettas, which is single vintage tawny ports. And they've proved that there's no such thing as a bad one. Even in vintage like 1974, where the wine was pale beige. <laughs> uh, that wine was still so delicious that Emirates First Class served it. So, I don't know. I, th I think in a weird way, we have these companies that have always sort of shone the light and the beacon for Porto. Like Fonseca and Taylor's, a Fladgate Yeatman partnership. Then you've got uh, the Symington Group. So you've got um, Dow, War, Graham's, Smith Woodhouse, Gould Campbell. And then you've got the standalone Quinta Donaval, owned by the French um, insurance company AXA. But there's this little company, along with side of Burmester, and there's one other called Feuerherd. And um, they've slowly crept up beside the famous, prestigious public schoolie Port Lodges. And give them a proper kicking recently. You can buy wine. I, I drank a 1941 Tawny Colletta from these guys. I don't know what it's worth now. About seven, eight hundred pounds. Certainly seven hundred euros. Um, this isn't that expensive, <laughs> but it is a Tawny. So it's spent the entire life. All the wine has spent its entire life in pipa or pipes, which are 550 litre barrels, very strange looking barrels. And the wine's been in there to age and to accelerate their aging in barrel rather than in bottle where it slows things down. Um, and the minimum age of anything that's in this bottle is seven years. So this is a seven, a minimum seven-year-old toy. I'm not sure why it's not being sold as a 10-year-old unless it's just seven, eight and nine. But it is terrific tawny port. And it does look like Sogovinius and Kopka are really specialised in making tawny port. Um, look at the colour. That's tawny if it's a day. It's kind of colour of an owl, I suppose. Tawny owl, yeah. Um, full of deep fruit, some dried leaf. Some oxidation, sure. Um, but this is a wine that's normally fifteen ninety nine or sixteen ninety nine. This is one of the other wines at Waitrose you can buy this Christmas for 10 quid. And for 10 quid, that is a bargain. To recap, the Cap on Dew was my surprise today. In a weird way, I think that's my favourite wine in this lineup. Eight ninety nine for classic Southern French red, for any any purpose whatsoever, particularly with cold cuts. We have a Malbec, quite rare to find one of those from Stellenbosch in South Africa, thirteen quid. Very good, very fine, very crunchy, easy to drink. The Chateau Livestock, Omodoc, two thousand and fifteen. Absolutely fantastic. Um, very, very much at the at the median of its life. I won't say the end of its life, because it's probably going to be fine for a few more years. But drink now. And then we've got Chianti Classico from um, Agrico Cachabella called Ardalico, which if you really, really want to treat yourself, there is no finer drink on earth 
with steak. The Chianti Classico. And then we've got this beautiful little dessert wine at the end, which you can open at the beginning of Christmas and drink over a week, no problem at all. So there you go. Two days full of Waitrose. I wonder what's next. See you next time.